standing, we'll read the last paragraph of Romans 4, verses 16 through 25. We'll read, deal with verses basically 17 to 22. <clears throat> For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, for his sake, on, not for his sake only, was it written that it was credited to him, but for your sake also to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Thus far, our God's inspired and holy word you may be seated. <clears throat> Amen. Just what is faith? Faith's one of those things that people talk a lot about without giving a lot of attention to how it operates. Let me illustrate it for you children. You are in the mall uh, with your father, and he says, stand by me here, and I will take care of you. You were afraid. The crowd was all pressing in, and uh, you were comfortable because you knew your father and you believed his word. When I was a, a child, I don't remember really my age, but my father took me someplace and he told me to stay in the car and he'd be back in a few minutes. Now, it was a bit of a scary experience, uh, but I never doubted the fact that he would come back, although I began to wonder there after a while because for a child it seems so long. But because he was my father and I knew him, then I would accept his word. Uh, now, if it were a stranger, and I'm sure all of you children have been taught, if, if a stranger asks you, do you want to ride home, or would you like to come into their house, what are you supposed to say to them? No. Because you don't know who they are, and thus you are not to trust them. So, that is an illustration of faith. You trust your parents because you know who they are, and you have confidence in their taking care of you, and you don't trust a stranger because you don't know who he is. So why do we trust God? We trust God because we know who he is. Many people today talk about faith as simply a subjective blind leap in the dark. Stand on the diving board of the deep end, close your eyes, and jump off. That's faith. No, that's not faith. Faith uh, is an acting on the basis of who God is and what God promises. And that's what we learn in this text today from Abraham. We see that Abraham not only is the father the, of the heirs of God, the father of all those who are justified by faith, but he's also the father of all the believing ones. And I think that Paul is going now a step further in his arguments from the life of Abraham particularly as it's set forth in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. So Paul has been developing this argument of how Abraham was justified by faith, how that was confirmed in the experience of David, how Abraham had his inheritance by faith, showing us how all these things apply to us. 
Now he puts Abraham before us as the pattern of the believing saint, or the pattern of faith. So what I want to show you from verses 17 to 22, that faith is the acting of the soul that looks beyond circumstances to the God who is and trust in his promises. Faith is the acting of the soul that looks through the circumstances to the God who is and trust his promises. I seek to show you three things from these verses. The pattern of faith, the focus of faith, and the character of faith. Well, Abraham is set before us as the pattern of faith. I say we basically do 17. We have to pick up again with verse 16. For this reason it, namely the inheritance, is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And then you'll see that the first part of verse 17 is a parenthesis. In the New American Standard, it's got parenthetic marks, it's got dashes, I think, in the ESV. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. End of parenthesis. And that uh, is a reference to Genesis 17, 5. And then it picks back up. So you could read this at the end of verse 16. Who is the father of us all in the presence of him whom he believed. So again, Paul is reminding us that uh, Abraham is the father of us all because he believed the promise. And here he takes the promise from Genesis chapter 17 in the parenthesis, a father of many nations have I made you. This will be the particular historic event that Paul is going to focus on in the life of Abraham. But now it's not simply a father of those who are justified and a father of the heirs of salvation, but now he is the father of those who believe because he believed that in the sight of God, in the presence of God, that God would do everything that he promised. And so he sets out the acting of Abraham, and uh, we all uh, can remember the story and in a sense the growth of Abraham's faith from Genesis 15 when God assured him that he would have the descendants more innumerable than the stars of heaven, uh, that uh, a seed would come, that seed uh, to whom he looked for salvation is going to come through his descendants. He had no uh, heir. God promises him a personal heir. Um, he believes that promise, but he wants to help God along, and so he seeks to provide a physical heir uh, through Hagar and Ishmael. God uh, thwarts that and rebukes that, and Abraham continues to grow until now. He's almost 100. He's 99 years old, and Sarah is 90, but she's barren, and they have had no children. And this is the particular event now that Paul has in mind when he said that um, he became the father of all believing in the presence of God this promise that in God's sight it was as if it were accomplished and that God was going to do everything that he said now Sarah's faith even at this point wavered a bit Abraham says well won't Ishmael work and God says no Ishmael's not going to work and it's the response of Abraham at that point that Paul has in mind here. And so he's set before us as a pattern of what a believer does. Now, with that pattern, that kind of background laid, we look next at the focus of faith, and we see the focus of faith is none less than God. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God. That's very important that we understand this. Just as you children uh, know that it's if your parents tell you something that you can trust them, uh, that uh, we exercise faith only because of God. 
Thus, there's a parallel. Your faith's going to be as strong as your theology of God is. Because God is to be the object of faith or the focus of our faith. Now, in this particular historical context, Abraham, almost 100, past childbearing age. Sarah, 90, barren and past childbearing age. Abraham focused on two important truths about God's omnipotence. Listed for us in verse 17, he believed even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So in the first place, as Abraham contemplated his and his wife's dead body, he came to the conclusion that God can bring life out of a barren woman and a man way past the age of bearing children. And it's basically a confidence in the power of a resurrection. That is the figure of death. Death by itself does not produce life. Now because Abraham grasped this principle here, uh, and we know he did from uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, exactly how he looked at this God who promised him uh, these things. We read in, in Hebrews 11. Well, Revelation won't work. So Abraham believed going out, and then in verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time, since she considered him faithful who promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, and that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So it was a concept of resurrection, bringing death out of life. So when he offered up Isaac then, a few years later, the same writer in Hebrews tells us that he did so because he believed in the resurrection. Isaac was the child of promise, and Isaac, your descendant, shall be called, verse 19. He considered that God is able to raise even from the dead, from which also he received him back as a type. He was willing, even though the promise resided in Isaac and Isaac alone, he was willing to take Isaac's life because he believed that God would raise the dead. That's what it took. The God who gave him Isaac, in a sense, his life from the dead is the God who would raise Isaac. And of course, in that, we have the glorious picture then of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which confirms all this reality about God for us, that God does raise the dead because God raised our Savior from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in His resurrection then is the guarantee of our resurrection, but of a God who can do that what can he not do? A God who can bring death from uh, life from death. A God who can raise a dead body and rejuvenate it. You see, he is omnipotent. He is El Shaddai. He is the God with whom nothing is impossible. And then, the second thing about God on which Abraham focused in this historical event was that he calls into being that which does not exist. I believe this is uh, a clear allusion to Genesis 1-1 and the, what we call creation ex nihilo, God making everything out of that which was not. Not simply nothing, but that which was not. The God who can do that, then Abraham would reason, is surely the God who can take a man and woman who were incapable of having children and do what? Give them children. Now, a little aside, perhaps you've wondered why in the world then does Abraham take a second wife and have all those children? Is that not a further testimony to these two things right here? That this hundred-year-old man now gets married again and has a whole host of children. 
because the rejuvenating power of God was so unconquerable that his body was now like the body of a younger man. This was the God on which Abraham focused. And because he believed God, who is, his faith could look through the circumstances. Now there are those today who decry doctrine. I was talking to a man this weekend, and he uh, is one of our graduates, not, in no way Edward, but he was, he's working now with a group that uh, they just have simple gospel. They're having a lot of baptisms, you know, and we've already had some email correspondence about this. Um, and I'm thinking, you don't understand. There can't be real faith without doctrine because you have to know who God is. That's where we have to begin. Who God is. For a sinner to come to faith and for any of us who go through life's difficulties and problems, and, and you all do, uh, if you don't know who God is, you don't have a foundation. You don't have an anchor. So, if you wrestle today with weak faith, the place for you to begin is with a strong God. A vibrant doctrine of God. And the fullness of the revelation of Scripture. The triune God who is and who rewards those who seek Him. The God who reveals Himself to us and all of His attributes. And so whatever your fears are, if, if, it's, it's, if it's dread and, and fear of guilt or whatever, here's the God who's gracious and, and kind and compassionate. If it's uncertainty about the future, here is the God who is all-powerful and all-wise. Whatever your difficulty is, there is in the triune God exactly those things on which you need to focus. And as you know who God is, as you learn who God is, you grow in your grasp of who God is, your faith is going to be strengthened. The same way then in our ministry to others and in our evangelism, we begin with God. We might start with a felt need as our Savior does with the woman at the well in Samaria. But we quickly have to go to God. The God who is, the God who is holy, the God whom we've offended, the God who is all-powerful and saves sinners regardless of what they've done. People need to know God as the triune creator and the holy being against whom they have sinned, but who remarkably would deal with them in compassion and grace if they would come to him in the way he appointed. Because this God is the one that provided the solution in taking to himself a human nature. So uh, we see that the focus of faith is always to be God. Brings us then to the uh, something of the character of faith as Paul develops that out of Abraham's experience. And the first thing is that faith then must take hold of the promises of God. It then believes in the Word of God. So he tells us these two things about God, and then verses 18 and 19, in hope against hope. What a great play on words. The first hope here is that hope of faith that is simply the certainty that God does what he says against hope, against all human conjecture and uh, uh, every possible doubt. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now here, he goes back to Genesis 15, 6, where this whole process with Abraham, in a sense, began. And he's, what he's saying is that Abraham had a specific promise that he would have these descendants. And though he tried to help God uh, fulfill that promise, he still believed in the promise. He hadn't come at that point to the position that this was going to be absolutely supernatural. He believed the promise, though, because God gave him a promise. But now, the time we come to 15.6, he had no doubt that God could do that. He does ask God to consider Ishmael, but he had no doubt that God would do whatever he promised, because what he knew about God now he joins that with 
a promise. And see, faith then, well, it's kind of like the, the, the leper. Uh, he, he said, I know you are able if you're willing. So we focus on God, and that's where faith begins. We must know that He is able. But how will we know if He's willing? Today, living in a day not of supernatural uh, messages from God, it is through Scripture. So we have a couple today, and they're childless. And they say, well, God is going to give us a child. Because God is the one who brings uh, something out of nothing and can bring death, uh, life out of death. And so they start telling their friends, we believe God, and because we believe God, He's going to give us a child. Well, God didn't make that promise to them. And without the promise, uh, faith becomes then presumption. That's part of the problem with the, the whole Dutch approach to making assurance really locked into faith. I don't find my name in the Bible. I believe that God saves every sinner who comes to Him. Uh, and so I can tell a sinner, if you have taken hold of Christ, God has saved you. Uh, and that level of assurance one must have. But I can't believe that, that God is going to save Joe Blow. Um, uh, that Joe Blow has to believe that God has, has saved him uh, because he doesn't have his name in the, in the Bible. Faith must focus then on the promises of the Bible. And there are multitudes of promises, and that's where we go then. We know who God is. We begin with our theology of God, and now we take the promises, and we can say with the leper, I know you're able if you're willing, and there are general promises, so God saves our children in the covenant. But again, He doesn't say He'll save every child in the covenant. I'll plead with God uh, if I had an unconverted child or an apostate child, to my dying breath, regardless of how wicked that child had become, because I believe that God is able. And so I will pray. But I don't have a specific promise about that child by name that God is going to, to save him. So we pray the general promises, and we pray them in the same way. Lord, I know, I know that you're able. Please be willing. And whatever that situation might be. And then with the specific promises with respect to uh, the church and uh, uh, the conversion of the nations and comfort that God promises to us in times of death and grief or in all of life's tumult. We have many precious promises that specifically we may be claimed by us and we take hold of them. So faith, knowing who God is, then will believe the promises. But the other aspect of the character of faith that um, Paul develops here is that faith must also be tested and wait. In verse 20, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God promised he was able to perform. Now you see, he never, he never doubted that God was going to give him the sea. That's, that's the th that's the thread that runs through this. But by Genesis 17 now, once he said, God, how about Ishmael? God said, no. Paul is telling us that even though he uh, uh, contemplated his own body, and by the way, there's a text, if you've got the New King James, it's he did not contemplate his body. Murray makes a very good point there. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the same thing. If it's, if it's the positive, it means he didn't pay a lot of attention uh, to his body. If it's the negative, he didn't get obsessed with the fact that his body uh, was dead. And, and either way, uh, through that weakness, uh, he um, believed the promise of God and did not then waver. Uh, he was 100 years old. She was dead in the womb. He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. And this is why God has us wait. Because the waiting is the testing, thus the growing of faith. In the same way, if you go in the gym and you, you work out, you have to break those muscles down. You have to go through repetition after repetition. It's through that testing and that trial that the muscle grows strong. Well, faith 
will only grow strong as God tests it. So he made Abraham wait. But faith grew stronger and stronger. He acquiesced to God's time plan. And he gave glory to God. That God would do what was right. That God would do that which was best. And so he acquiesced. He gave God the glory being fully assured that what God had promised he was able to perform. We're back again. I know you're able if you're willing. God's promise. So now willing and able have come together. So even though he has waited, he knows that God will do that which he has promised. And so God does make us wait. And God makes us wait so that faith more and more looks to God, depends upon God's word and his promises, and faith grows through the trials, the circumstances that will often appear insurmountable, as did Abraham's circumstances. But faith grows. And so Paul then comes to the conclusion that this is what justifying faith is about. Verse 22, Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. And what we see here are the elements of faith that we talk about in our catechism. That there was, there had to be knowledge. We've seen that, right? There has to be knowledge uh, for saving faith, or any kind of faith. That knowledge begins with who God is. So we're talking to an unconverted person, as we've already mentioned, who God is, uh, but also what God has done for sinners in Christ Jesus and the promises that God has made. If you repent and believe, God will save you. And then we must not waver in unbelief, but go through the ascent to the truth of the promises to rest on them. And that's what Abraham did. Remember, in all of this, we learn from the New Testament his eye was on the Savior to come. He knew that all of this had to be accomplished of a seed. So that the seed in whom, to whom he looked to save him would come forth and accomplish all that God had promised with respect to eternal salvation. And so, on the one hand, saving faith is very simple. It's not a complex thing. But it must begin with knowledge. As the child must know, these are my parents, I can trust them. This is God. He's told me so much about himself. And he alone is trustworthy. I believe then, everything that he said is true. And so we begin with that general faith. And then, but I will rest in the promises of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in my experience, not in some supernatural um, voice from heaven or dream. What I'm going to rest in the promise that God said, all who call upon me shall be saved. And that's, in a sense, the very simple way of faith. That is how faith works. So faith is the acting of the soul that looks through the circumstances to the God who is and trust his promises. And Abraham is the pattern of this faith for us in this historical example in his life. He shows us how we must know God, how we must believe the promise of God, and why God makes us wait. Now you're going to deal with people that think that they have out God's grace. You can come right here to this. Who God is. God is the God who loves to save sinners. The Bible is full of revelation of God saving the most despicable, the, the Manassas of the world. Adam and Eve, the murderers of the human race, are in heaven because of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul, who consented to the murder of Christians and threw them into prison, becomes the great missionary to the Gentiles. The Bible tells us plenty about a God who saves the most despicable of sinners. And there's no guilt that is too great uh, for the conquering blood and the perfect death of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no heart that is so dead that the powerful spirit who raised Christ from the dead will not also quicken that heart. And so in your evangelism you tell people don't despair. In your own situation you might have a brother, a sister, and they look far past being saved. Um, nobody 
is past being saved unless they've committed the unpardonable sin and they don't want to be saved. <laughs> and so uh, we see how faith works. And then in your own faith, if you are at times thrown off course because of the untoward circumstances of your life, family problems, financial problems, scheduling problems, whatever they are, they can be small things or big things. The place you must come back to is who God is and what God's promised you in his word. And then wait on him for his glory, knowing that he will do that which he has promised. And your faith will grow. You will be trained more and more to be a man, a woman, a boy or girl of strong faith. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this record of how faith acts, that we might understand better the acting of faith, that we might evaluate our own faith in Christ and know um, how we can grow in faith and that we'll be encouraged that we deal with others around us, Lord, that there are none too dead, that uh, you um, cannot save if you're willing to do so. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.